Miskell with EMS Now, and welcome to this edition of the Eric Miskell Show. Um, today, our topic will be an interesting one. It's uh, the, the use of AI in electronics manufacturing. Uh, before I get into that, just like some quick housekeeping issues. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Phil Stoughton. I always call him the man down under, but these days uh, he's in Europe right now, so the man across the pond today. Um, this, all of anybody uh, listening in, you will be muted and stay muted throughout the show so that we can cut down on any background noise. Um, if you do have questions that you wish to pose to, uh, to the panel, uh, please do so using the question um, tab at the bottom of the screen. And as always, this show is being recorded and will be rebroadcast on EMS Now next week. So um, feel free to share it with all your friends and family. They'll be super impressed. Um, let's begin. So the topic today is, is the use of AI in electronics manufacturing, and, and it's becoming ever more prevalent and some would even say critical within electronics manufacturing. And it was interesting at the recent Apex show, I know Phil and I were there, we noted that AI was, has become a very popular marketing term for many companies in advertising of their solutions. Everyone seems to have AI on it now. I think we've moved from industry 4.0 to AI, it seems like, in the marketing. So um, in order to help understand this better, uh, we decided to do what we usually do on this show, which is invite some experts who are far smarter than Phil or I on the given topic and ask them to help kind of explain the applications, benefits, and limitations. So to that end, we have two guests today. Um, joining us again uh, on the show is Sebastian Schall with Luminovo. And joining, we've interviewed Martin before, but Martin Strempel with ITAC Software, uh, and he's a first-time guest on the Eric Miskell Show. So Martin and Sebastian, thank you for joining us today. Um, let me begin just by asking you each to introduce yourselves briefly, maybe, and, and focusing specifically on, on the area of AI and your kind of your expertise in that realm. Um, Martin, since it's your the first time on, you get to go first. All right, well, thank you, Eric. Um, so yeah, my name again, Martin Strempel. I'm with iTech. I've been here for two years at iTech, uh, definitely in a business development uh, role. And uh, my background started yeah, almost yeah, some seven, eight, uh, if not longer, years ago in production, uh, actually in the automotive field for one of the main automotive producers that we, uh, you know, uh, car producers. And I think that's also where the actual relevance of AI and how it need, will impact the future became very um, visible to me at that point early on. And from then, obviously, I was there for a number of years, introduced the first number of uh, IoT projects in that area, AI projects in that area. And then about two years ago, swapped to iTech, where here in my new role, I work closely with our iTech customers, where the focus is really understanding where their pain points are at the moment with these kind of topics, and how you know their roadmaps and, and helping them move along to developing uh, more fledged, more fully fledged AI systems in their production lines. Okay, very good, Sebastian. Yeah, thank you again for having me. So yeah, I'm Sebastian, one of the two managing directors and founders of Luminovo. So my career originally started in electrical engineering uh, at the TU here in Munich. Um, so basically as an electrical engineer, I was then lucky enough to like get accepted to, to Stanford for my master's. Um, and that was 2015. And that was exactly when this, the last AI hype cycle, I think, had its beginning. So at that time when you were at Stanford and you uh, were, had some applied math in your past curriculum, there was actually only one way you could go down and it was machine learning at the time. So um, my co-founder and I actually met there and we got our head, um, heads down and dug our heels into the machine learning space and got super excited about the field. We then took basically this knowledge back from the Valley to Europe because we felt we had that one and a half year knowledge arbitrage being basically straight out of university and then founded Luminovo originally as an AI solutions boutique. So we 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 had a lot of exposure to like deep neural networks. So that was basically like one of the the hypes at the time that 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 came along and uh, mostly 
So using like image data, text data, and complex signals. And we were consulting for around two years and building software applications for like um, 20 different companies, about 30 projects. So from like chip companies like Infineon to automotive companies like Daimler, BMW, but also to other companies in like the insurance space. And um, that was basically our big exposure to AI before we felt AI is going to become a base technology. and uh, it's going to be this infused in many different things. And if you need AI to sell your value proposition, you probably don't have a value proposition. And then we felt, where can we take what we've learned to an industry that we really love? And um, we flipped then the company to uh, basically now build software for the electronics industry and basically use our automation capabilities um, up under the hood without needing a buzzword uh, to sell a solution too much. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's very good. Listen, I wanted to start by kind of maybe defining terms. And I said this before we went on. And, and I will say before, and to the audience too, the reason I liked having both these gentlemen on is having spoken to them both before on topics related to AI, I was impressed by how they're able to make kind of these complex ideas kind of simple. And they speak in kind of layman terms that helps people like me at least understand it a lot better. But um, so let's kick off. As far as, you know, there's a lot of, press lately, I guess it's the chat GPT, the bings of the world, right? All of this is coming out and we're fearful again that the computers are gonna take over the world and slaughter all of us, I guess. But I, I'd like to maybe draw a distinction, maybe Sebastian, start with you, kind of the distinction of, of that type of AI versus what's really being used in electronics manufacturing today. Can you kind of maybe help differentiate that if possible? Yeah, sure. So maybe I would quickly start with that, like the larger term, like. Uh, AI space. So I think there's one actually Wikipedia article that's called the AI effect that I think the general public always thinks about AI, about the things we can still not yet do. And everything that's not AI is something we can already do. But in a general terms, it's not actually true. So generally AI is in a sense, like a machine that can solve any task that a, would require some form of human decision-making, human intelligence somehow. And that's not that's just answering the question what problem we are solving, but not how we're solving it. And if we don't go a little bit deeper and look into the how, there's basically two types of AI. One is the like classic expert system that actually has been around for quite some time. That can be something like a simple rule or more complex rule sets, and the machine learning um, um, space, which is basically stochastic models that try to extract knowledge from data, not by being explicitly programmed or given rules by an expert. And then the next layer between there is more a distinction between which family of algorithms you're using. If you're using classic statistical models that we've been known for quite some time, it's basically classic machine learning. And if you then go deeper, um, you use a family that's called deep neural networks, then you add deep learning. And all the AI we basically that has been the hype cycle I described before in 2015, 16, and the hype cycle we see right now are all basically built on deep, new paradigm shifts in deep learning. So all neural network based. However, this last cycle that I basically was like educated in at Stanford was very much focused on kind of analytical AI. So it was basically the AI, which is kind of trying to automate some expert human judgment, basically classifying images, classifying documents, classifying defects in an assembly line. This is basically the model sees some unstructured input and gives out like a prediction, a class or maybe a, a number. This new phase of AI we're in right now is more, it's in the generative AI space. So the, the output we're seeing is not like an analysis, a clear pattern recognition, but it's more, it's like a, a generative sequence, being it an image or being a text. That what the big distinction here is then this this old like analytical AI space was mainly kind of attacking human job like like blue collar jobs right like mm. not so it's like classification like jobs where you're at the factory you you were doing a repetitive task and that's I think what what was the this first phase was in why people are now getting a little bit more crazy is this generative AI is now taking on white collar jobs because it's taking on copywriting tasks, like creative tasks. So it's basically come from this observer economy to like the creator economy. And I think that's the big distinction mm -hmm. um, in what I, what I would draw, but maybe there's um, something for you to add before I talk too long. <laughs> yeah. 
Martin, I see your you thinking there. I see your eyes. What would you like to add to that? No, no, I agree. So, I mean, I think in the first step, uh, when when we introduced this technology, I, I really don't think if we if we really go back, it wasn't such a leap forward, right? We we had uh, really mechanical ways, really sort of like uh, logical ways of structuring programs, and then you know as we go along, we we optimize these things. So, I like to think of it almost if we take it completely the big picture. Right in the beginning, we sort of used to have to program in ASM, right? Then we started writing compilers and it made it easier. And then we started writing, you know, we had these nice interfaces and your uh, to help you with your programming and get production and, and, and make it easier for people to develop algorithms. And then at some point people realized, well, can't we get the algorithms to start sort of programming themselves to a degree as well? And that was sort of the, the first steps that we saw in, in, in what we now call, you know, machine learning and AI. Uh, and then I agree completely with what Sebastian said. What, what now we've seen the shift lately, where we've gone from potentially these old things, where we uh, the old methods where we would compare results and then get things to do uh, uh, you know sort of classification tasks and be able to recognize patterns. Uh, all sort of like more on the analysis side. Looking forward, now we've moved into a, a, a sphere where we're using these algorithms to actually make predictions and uh, you know establish scenarios and things of like what the future might look like uh, and one of those consequences has been that we're now sort of getting this appearance that uh, the machines can now be creative too which I think has been one of those interesting outputs of uh, something like chat GPT and even also the automated image generation that we've seen in the last yeah six months where we we're getting really creative what we would even consider creative outputs from 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 these algorithms right yeah. So creative is an interesting word because some of it's just plain wrong, um, <laughs> which I think is interesting. I, I'd ask you both, is that is that purely down to the selection of data set that you're using to train? When you look at chat GPT, it's basically trained on everything that's on the Internet without any filters as to what's accurate and what's inaccurate. Well, I'll start. I think the, the the word creative is a reference to what we are expecting from algorithms this far, right? So suddenly, uh, from from what we're seeing in terms of what's possible, suddenly it's it's jumped up. Uh, but I agree with you. It is we we've we've got to be careful with the word, right? Um, I think one of I mean obviously what one is addressing with the with these new algorithms is the way they consume data, and I think when we talk about consuming data and also how algorithms are used, you're bordering on a lot of the, uh, you know, also legislative topics that probably we'll also discuss in a little bit more detail that are coming into into play these days uh, with all of the legislation being passed uh, about who is responsible for what when you're developing this sort of uh, technology. But yeah, essentially, the the what's developed on on what we've seen so far is completely uncensored and unfiltered, right? Uh, I think chat GPT actually goes to great lengths to try and filter the end result as well so that it doesn't land up uh, in hot water with certain you know untrained unfiltered things so there is already a sort of censoring taking place by the people who are actually producing these algorithms and making them available to make sure that one doesn't uh, you know yeah, land in sort of uh, <laughs> yeah a very areas. I mean, we've seen some examples of, you know, other other maybe chat algorithms that had to be pulled from the net within 24 hours because of because they learned certain patterns uh, in an uncensored way. And uh, I agree. So the, the the data set can be very important to actually the outcome. And I think that is uh, one of the fundamental things that one needs to understand about this technology. Right? That who and what data you use to program it, and how and who decides it's working properly. Uh, contains both all of our biases if we're aware of them or not and yeah. therefore these these algorithms will some in some way always mimic our behavior as yeah. well yeah i think yeah. what's interesting when i look at both of your experiences you've 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 come at it with a with a kind of an ai first approach uh and sebastian as an example you learned about AI and then you then you looked at the electronic manufacturing industry and tried to figure out how to how to apply it and I guess that's true to a degree to with you as well Martin I'd like to hear really from you how you kind of selected the problems that you were going to apply AI to perhaps starting with you Sebastian yeah so I think in general um the general approach to I think thinking about AI is like 
as I said before, it's one tool in the toolbox mm -hmm. that can be applied to, to specific problems better than the other. And in my mind, it's there are a few like AI first use cases where really the application you try to develop is only possible if you think it AI first from, from the get-go. But I think there are many more problems that you can somehow solve today with like a brittle approach of just like writing down some rules. And then you can try to see like how you can start applying AI to it and actually improving on that baseline. And I think that's how the, from these like 30 projects we've done with a lot of hype where people just said, like, I just need to have AI in it. And even if we told them it's not needed, you can solve it differently. They still wanted it for the buzzword. And I think that's what we wanted to do differently. Basically just look at what are the different problems here? How can we quickly get a baseline out? And then thinking about like an AI application that can be better. So I think the three types of applications that we kind of have in place is one really about kind of data processing. So that's basically how can you clean up messy data for us that's mostly you know bill of materials that are corrupted cat files how can you use like a, a system that first maybe on with rules just check does some checks but then have like a, a learned system that can really improve on cleaning that messy data i think that's one bucket the other bucket was this whole idea of recommendations right where how how can you for us specifically in the supply chain shortage, how can you recommend different part alternatives, different supplier alternatives to the to the user? And that can be something, the first baseline can be super simple, right? You have seen those two parts before in one project. It's just like a hard recommendation, but then you can move into a more statistical approach as you go. I think the last one is also this like anomaly detection, right? Where how can you, if you find design for manufacturing issues, design for assembly issues that they are also hardcore ruled versions of it, but then as you go, can you relax it to something more elastic? And I think that has always been the idea: get this first task where you can have it, like get a brittle rule out. A first human can use it. You can maybe start even to to store interaction patterns, whether using humans correct something or not. You and then use that to kind of feed your stochastical models. Mm. It's interesting, actually, you mentioned like AI first, that my career actually developed completely the other way around, right? I was in, in production control, in production steering, and faced with, uh, you know, one of the departments I was responsible for was, you know, uh, uh, securing the information in our MES system uh, and using the MES system, obviously, to steer the whole production line and production facility. And my my interest in the subject grew out of that right it started from exactly like this we had up that up to that point simple rules and things in the systems to know what's going on and where you are and one realized quickly that hang on you've got so much information you can still make so many more accurate decisions if you actually put this information together properly um i mean obviously in your production your key three areas are always like your quality that you're trying to understand like if i make an and and i think from coming out of a production control perspective the question was always like how will the decisions i'm making now influence the future much more in terms of what you're trying to uh, actually solve so you would ask like if i make this quality decision now what does that mean for my production facility what does that mean for my work in progress or where i'm standing and so most of the questions were asked that way around and then you really quickly quite came to the point, well, okay, the MES system is great for knowing what's happening now, but it doesn't really help me understand what decisions I should take in the future to help me uh, optimize what's going to happen. And that's sort of also, and I think that's potentially the fourth kind of use case that I've seen uh, as a quote, as you know, obviously with optimizing processes and helping people make decisions uh, on on the data now and then also at, at some point scenario planning is going to become an essential part of the production steering production control facility that you're going to need you, your machine's going to be able to work out uh run through all of these thousands and millions of iterations of what possible scenarios are going to happen and give you the best decision that you can make at this point which at the moment we still rely on pure intuition that's why a plant director has been there for 20 years right that's his job he's got 20 years yeah. of experience and knowing what a good decision is and a bad decision but I think uh, we've now reached at a point where, you know, through technology like reinforcement learning, we can actually run all of these scenarios on computers and have computers help us at least aid us in making good decisions. Yeah, if that if that AI system can have that person's 20 years experience plus 20 other people's experience, it's um, 
you know, it's got a it's got a good chance of at least coming up with some decent suggestions as to what the right decision might be. Yeah. And I think I think people the thing is you work with people and there's you know and then again you bring in the two very important things that I feel at least from a production perspective so so I think my focus is very much in production also you know I mean I work for an MES provider uh, so we work with the MES data and it's also the focus of what we're doing in terms of the AI field but there the the projects are all about either making things more reliable or improving efficiency right yeah. and AI is really well suited to I mean in the in the more general sense of it. Uh, and actually helping us with these tasks, uh, understanding how to make things, automate things, right? Uh, or understanding how to actually, where the problems are and helping us identify those. And then, then it acts more like uh, our lean pool box where we actually, it, it can be seen as an additional, a brand new tool to our lean set of tools that we've been developing over the last 20 years that, that it fits in nicely. It fits perfectly with what technology is doing in the next step. And it helps us actually just do and follow the same processes we've been following up to now as well in the yeah. in the near term future, I would say. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. One of the big debates I've been hearing recently with respect to chat GPT, but with respect to AI generally is this idea of pilot co-pilot and, and how do you use the system? If I look at it from, from, um, from my point of view as a journalist, I ask it to write something um, and it is not usable because it's made made some some uh, some real errors in terms of inaccuracies, and there are some things in there that fundamentally are just incorrect. Um, but if I use it as a as a research tool from a point of view of me being able to um, take that and use my experience to to turn that into something useful, then it it does it does operate as a, as a good co pilot tool. Is that a differentiation you think is important in the manufacturing space? Well, I think in either way, it's the intermediate step where we are, right? The human is still very much in the loop in everything we're looking at at the moment. And I think also when we start looking at legislation, it's also very much, especially if we look at the new directives that the EU is proposing and things like that, we're looking very much at the human and the professional societies and bodies that are already existing, at least in the engineering field, right? It's, it's different. And I think that's one of the big differentiators between like the fields where chat GPT is being uh, let loose in that sense, right? Over everything, over everyone's data, anything that's on the internet and something that is actually an engineering field where essentially, ultimately, you as a manufacturer still have the responsibility to, to prove, right? It, I, under all of your ISO norms and audits and everything that you are responsible for, that you're making decisions in 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 you know under good faith under the for the right uh, reasons, and therefore uh, the the take that they're having on on legislation in this field is very interesting, right? Because it means they actually the EU is pushing the responsibility back down to the people who are going to be using it, and saying okay, within your existing norms and within your existing regulations, we believe we have a strong enough framework already to uh, manage these type of uh, questions and uh, regulations, uh, which if we boil it down one step further to what that means as an engineer, then applying it is essentially as an engineer, even an AI engineer, in future, if I decide to implement an algorithm, I have to stand the same way you have as an engineer, if you design a bridge and you have to put your signature on it, I will have to stand in future, I'm not saying it's there yet, but in future, I will have to stand there, put my signature on and say that this algorithm uh, to the best of my knowledge, will perform with this data set that I've used to train it and perform the task well so that, you know, I'm not putting anybody's life in danger or whatever the uh, safety requirements or uh, norms that you, you know, trying to get audited for. Um, yeah. So. I would and like to like add two anyone? things. One is the yeah. on the co-pilot topic, and then also on the thing you just mentioned, which I think was a very good point. So on the co-pilot topic, I think one thing that's um, maybe important for people to share is like what made chat GPT now so much better than like the GPT-3 model that has been around already. The th crazy thing is the chat GPT, the, the language model that feeds chat GPT is actually smaller than the best available GPT-3 model that we know, but it was fine-tuned with a method that was similar to what was already mentioned, but um, reinforcement learning from human feedback. So exactly mm -hmm. this co-pilot setup was exactly necessary to get the model to that level of performance where we have it right now. So that's also a take for like how people should think about this new creative technology is exactly that, like you, having using the model, seeing the output is not perfect and putting it away and discarding its capability is in my, my point a huge mistake because exactly this 
the interacting with the model, correcting the model, and having like a system that can gets that feedback is exactly what made the model so powerful in the first place. So that's why I think this co-pilot setup is really what's what's the best best of a state of the art that you should really think about currently. Also, when you are thinking about building a technology around this, can you get like a, an application out there fast with a lot of users and get a first baseline model out that can then again actually get human feedback on on its decisions? I think that's one one point to make. That mostly applies now for this generative space we talked about. So for the space that also like iTech is operating in, right? It's a lot of analytical stuff. Yeah, there's simulation how we can make a little bit predictions, but there it's more this old style of human feedback that we have seen where you can on the analytical side keep like labeling data and making correcting some decisions and on the other side maybe like looking at some scenarios and making more some like outlier detection and correcting the model a little bit but it's a little bit of a different like operating model that we see in these two different uh, approaches and that also brings us to this um, legislation topic that you talked about that these Generative models are based on a lot of, you know, a lot of data, a lot of text that's available on the internet. And I think there's also a lot of debate currently at the moment of who actually has uh, IP to this model. Is it because everything is on the web, it's free? Or is it basically if mm. if now Google is queer, is crawling Quora, then would actually Quora have the right to put a something like a robot TXT document on their website that basically forbids these models from accessing their data. And I think that's like a debate that we'll continuously see with these like crawling intensive uh, models. But as was mentioned before is when you have your own data sets, right? Then we are, we are like back to this, what can you build on top of this as a pro proprietary setup? Um, but yeah, for some of these new paradigms, it's different. It's not just, here's my old data set and I can just reuse it, but it's really about getting something in production quickly and getting that interaction going. I think that's just um, a point yeah. that I, I recently realized that I think is important to make. Yeah, let me pick up on that legislation piece because I wanted to ask, you know, you have that recent initiative, what is it the, from the EU US Trade and Technology Council, right? And that they're to develop international AI governance standards. Right, and I and I, I was reading that, and it says that the the it, the intent is to join forces and support development of AI in five socially critical areas. Right, so I'm wondering, how does that would that even apply then in what we're talking about here with the use of it in electronics manufacturing, or is it not at all? It, it does reference it, but it basically, my understanding interpretation of 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 what they're proposing in terms of legislation is that they feel the so. They break it down into obviously in terms of risk, uh, they have this risk structure when it comes to the things. And at the top of the pyramid, they, they're very much, uh, you know, looking at, at AI being used for the wrong reasons or without knowledge. So again, it's a social impact, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they actually see uh, AI in a controlled environment, uh, say for example, in, in something tangible like uh, engineering, or maybe like if you're doing in terms of, you know, your traceability or track and tracing in, in, in like medical devices or something like that, where it's, it's, it's key as well as very much something where the existing frameworks are strong enough already to uh, handle that. And we see the same thing sort of coming through in the professional societies now too, right? So, they're, And they're also moving that legislation. They're saying, we're not actually in the position to know if this is safe now for people in manufacturing to use or not. Rather, that's what all your professional bodies are for. And your professional bodies will have to learn how to govern that in the future. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> in, in one sense, they have defined it, but in another sense, they've just passed the, the buck to, to the professional societies and saying, well, okay, you guys are the only ones who actually can keep up to speed with the technology because our legislation can't. And therefore, that is a much more, uh, yeah, a much a quicker feedback loop and also to, to be able to manage this, you know. And in some ways, maybe a more ideal solution. I think most industries, government probably prefers that they self-regulate rather than <laughs> the government having to come in and do it, right? I don't know. Sebastian, what are your thoughts on that, on the legislation side, as far as it, yeah, I, as it I mean, applies within this? So, Yeah, so I mean, in general, I think the like the, there was a, a lot of also historic debate about this idea of like explainable AI and how make it explainable. Um, or even contestable, so you can basically kind of audit its decision. Mm -hmm. And I think it's 
Um, I think that's something we'll probably, in my mind, see a second spring where we will see how can we also show also make this, these old models, but also the new models kind of give us more context on like confidence levels on like resources where they draw this knowledge from. So you can kind of debug it and contest it a little bit. For analytical, right, there was often, we did this actually in the past for like, it was like in the medical space where you could give like a confidence level from like how confident the model is, but also another score, which is like, was this this data that you've seen completely out of distribution. So have you never seen something like that before to give these two scores to allow you how trustworthy is that decision at the moment? Mm -hmm. And with these generative models, it's now a little bit different because they're basically just trained on just predicting kind of the next word that's pl that's most plausible. And it's basically just doing a good job in like getting good grammar and something that's cohesive. But the fact checking is basically it's not so easy to dissect this, right? What's like, mm -hmm. where does it a good job in predicting proper English and where does it a good job in factually correct stuff and where does it get this data from? And I think that's like this new piece that we have to kind of unveil. And applying this to manufacturing, I think in the spaces that um, Martin is also operating in, I think there it's rather on this old, old schema where you really just make this confidence level clear um, to the operator, maybe even in a report, where you can then make out your decision right as a business, you can say, hey, this is the kind of curve we've seen in the past on how wrong a good decision that the system was. And I can make my decision. How costly is the um, making a mistake? Like one from the legal implications, but also from like material mm -hmm. like damages. And how much does automation gain for me? And giving the companies to this to calibrate on their own, which kind of risk reward trade-off curve they want to run. And I think that's like something that I would like to see more when we talk about this um, to basically give more people the freedom to operate themselves and make these business decisions as long in manufacturing, we often talk about material damage, not, you know, human lives. And I think that's like a completely different ethical discussion to have. Yeah. So, so just switching gear a little bit into the applications with the, within the electronic manufacturing space, how do you look at a problem and decide whether or not AI is the solution? Is it the amount of data that has got to be consumed to, to make a decision that makes it impossible for a human? Is it the amount of domain knowledge? Is it expertise? How do you, how do you look at that ecosystem of manufacturing, the decisions that are being made every day on the shop floor and say, hey, this one would really suit an AI application? Whoever wants to go first, Martin. I'll start. So, I mean, normally, normally, just from a business development point of view, you really want to start with where the customers are actually having pain points at the moment. So, mm -hmm. it's normally our starting point more than anything else. They come to us with a problem that you know they would like solved, and then then you decide, well, is the problem solvable at all? You go through a whole bunch of check criteria at all before you even get to the AI branch that that might be something that you can look at. Um, there's a number of factors that go into something for AI and also see the biggest mistake is that we, we do develop, or at least in, in manufacturing, we develop maybe silo solutions that work well, uh, for, for a case that shows the concept, but it, it, the way we construct the use cases and the way we approach the problem means that we'll, you'll never be able to go into a widespread production with that algorithm, uh, for a number of reasons, but normally because then the business case falls apart completely as well, due to things like, uh, do I have the connectivity I need across, you know, 16 different sites? Do I have the data connection and the data rates that I need across every, everything? Uh, you know, will the use case be applicable? What about all of the specialization? Do I have to retrain it for everywhere? And 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 then soon you get to very specific scenarios where uh, you're you it, it's very difficult for somebody implementing something across his whole organization or her organization to say that, uh, well, this risk, at least on the managing the algorithm, is manageable enough for me to want to take the next step and is going to bring the rewards that I want in. Right? Uh, they, in production, people are very scared to introduce something that in two years no one remembers what it was doing or how it works, uh, and it causes three outages. Whatever your return on investment was, by that time you've you've lost your business case, right? So reliability and maintenance and who's going to maintain it and how it's going to be maintained are very important considerations, at least in my experience, in the manufacturing field, right? Yeah. 
Sebastian, Sebastian what would you add? Yeah, no, I think I agree. And I think what I would add is, I think how I classify these things often is like one is, do you have like in manufacturing, is it like a kind of input output problem that you're trying to solve, right? Finding a defect, for example, like is it that, that scope of a problem or is it something where there's like a multidimensional like space simulation that you would need to run? Um, and the second one is often like a human just couldn't do it. Right, because we could, yes, we have some intuition, but you couldn't run, like look into a thousand dimensional space and find an optimum there. So that's like a problem which is clearly like made for a computer. And sometimes if it's too, too large of a space, then it's actually also made for like AI in the sense that we can search that space, that realm of possibilities more effectively than just brute forcing everything. I think that's uh, for me like one, one big chunk that goes in a similar direction to that you environments that you could in theory simulate, but they would be extremely expensive to simulate. And then you find like a good approximation of that simulation to, to guide your decision making. Um, and then this is like this bucket in my mind, this high dimensional space that you try to grasp, which a human couldn't really do. And the other is this more input output problem where currently a human might be able to do it if they're well trained, but it's just tedious. You need an expert, you need like a train this person and um, you want to just automate it like basically a next level of robotics. And I think these are for me, like the two if I look at manufacturing, the two buckets I look at. And, um, and then, you know, again here, if it's like a very e easy problem input output, maybe you can solve it very stupidly, right? The AOI machines of, of the past, they have also worked, but they were basically just brute force by rules. Yeah? And if you would change the lighting condition a little bit, then they would basically like throw an error. Mm -hmm. Now you can like use like stochastical models to be a bit a little more robust, yeah? but it's like similar problem, different family of algorithms. And uh, I think the similar concept applies here. If you didn't look into these like more simulation environments um, where you could probably do it before, but now you can maybe do it better. And uh, this is how I probably would uh, divide, divide them. Yeah. You know, I let me kind of go off of that a bit, Sebastian, because I always think in terms of kind of, you know, it's the wisdom pyramid, right? You start at the bottom and you're gathering all the data and you're probably, you do all these things, but at the top, you're making a business decision, right? So it sounds like in the, and I liked what you said earlier that it's just AI is one of the tools in your toolbox, right? It may not always be the applicable tool. So I can see it's very applicable in kind of after everything's connected, processing the data, developing the trend, seeing that, and then it has to generate some type of output, but then a decision has to be made from a business perspective, right? And I see that almost at two different levels too. There's some, you know, is this a good part or not bad part, I guess, but then what are we going to do business-wide? And from a business perspective, Martin, right, as you're out dealing with people, how helpful is it at that at kind of what I call the tip of the of the pyramid there, right? That wisdom and what and decisions that you have to make in business, or does that then just become revert back to the humans, the business managers who take the output from the tool and use their experience and their intuition to decide yeah. what to do? I think that is the key reason why it's been, yeah, why it's been so. I mean, everyone's always talking like we've been investing so much into AI and and. IOT for so many years, so you know, why is it not moving on and why are we still talking, you know, that we've yeah. been talking about the same ideas for years. But I think that that is the crux of it, right? Because the tasks that we entrusting the machines to to you know look after at this point are very much on that, you know, on the shop floor, making a decision then and there, something that I can then, you know, uh validate and verify afterwards as well. Uh, and, and we're not yet at the point where we we um looking at well, first of all, I don't think we're there that many tools that are actually, you know, aiding futuristic decisions yet. Like I think we've touched on it before. We, we're still very much on the anal analytic side when it comes to the data that we have in production. Uh, the next step will be to look a little bit much more forward in what's going on. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I would say it, it, we we restricting the scope to a large part at the moment too because we're not willing to take that business decision because eventually the costs if it doesn't work are astronomical for a company versus the potential benefits that you could get by maybe being able to automate a certain process or you know 
there's there's a risk reward uh, yeah. element to the whole whole the whole game too, right? <clears throat> And and we know that the the, the risk on in production if you stand for a, top, a couple of days because somebody turned your AI server off at this thing and then no one knows how you know which we've heard because it was updated then you know we've got cases like that where they lose a whole day of production because yeah. uh, because you know the AI was integrated with everything else and then you're like okay that it doesn't register all efficiencies it hasn't, it hasn't, to get back. you know it hasn't filtered through into all of the ITIL requirements and all of your IT requirements yet and we've got these standalone P POCs still running in corners and things like that it's actually almost the most dangerous situation to have for your production at that point but then again that's also when you realize that if we're going to integrate these things they're going to have to be on the same level of uh, of uh, reliability that we have for IT systems, if not even higher, right? Uh, yeah. We need that guarantee that it works all the time. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Hey, gonna make guys, decisions. guys one of the things I'm curious about is, are there other industries that we should be looking at that have applied AI exceptionally well? Do you look at other sectors mm -hmm. and think, yeah, they've really um, figured it out and they're doing a great job with it? Or is everybody in this kind of same situation where they're trying to figure out how and where and, and why. I mean, I think in general, the more you are let in the digital world, not in the physical world, the easier it is, right? So I think um, if you just look in, that's like, for it, example, that's the industry that moves money, right? If you look at the financial industry, how many like quant trades are currently done by automatic systems. I think that's probably the most money printing application that you have today. Or if you look at like basically, in a sense, Google, right? The whole company is built on like the most widely spread used machine learning algorithm patron at um, of all times. So, but I think is this the more you look into the physical space, the the tougher it gets. Um, mm. But I think there's often some looking into the mechanical world a little bit, and there's of course probably some things you can see there that have, but they're a little bit more ahead because some of the complexity is less. So if you think about, you know, predicting like just from from CAD files, from shapes, predicting roughly what what manufacturing steps are needed and deriving costs from that, deriving bottlenecks from that. So I think they, because the scope is easier, are in that case, a little bit ahead. And I think we already see electronics moving in a similar direction. And that's just like an analogy that I think one can always pull. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey, you know, I guess one of my questions, we talked about government in terms of legislation, but how critical is, is government, I guess, investment needed for the furtherance of the field? Or, or, or is this kind of, you know, I always think in terms of public-private kind of, you know, where is it coming from? Is this, is, is there sufficient in the, in the industry to continue to drive it? Or does the government have a role too? Not from a legislative perspective, but more from an investment and in, in helping to bring what governments can do more than people sometimes, large amounts of cash, <laughs> right, to the table to help advance industries. Is, is there a role there or is the private industry sufficient? Hmm. I, and that's a good question. <laughs> that's a tough, tough one. I mean, I think what I can just say is that what you definitely see is that this kind of, you know, big tech that we've seen in like and other in the cloud space or other application spaces, it's like a similar paradigm is again also happening in this space. There are a few companies that have the capabilities to really train like large models at scale. Um, mm -hmm. That's more in this like generative AI space we talked about before, but I think that's by the nature of how we train these models in large scale, if that trend kind of continues also to swift over to the, mechan the manufacturing space where we as Martin said before, we don't have these like very narrow use case models that have to be retrained in every single task, but we get into something like that's more generally applicable, what we've seen with language now. Mm -hmm. I think that is a space where definitely scale matters. And you will see like probably a big, a big company being if that's if the models are also playing that well to this to some of these spaces that will take the leap. And I think there government can definitely play a role to kind of create a counterbalance. Um, because all these companies like OpenAI that started, as the name implies, as open, have been very much become close AI and very much commercial. And um, I think why? Because it takes a lot of money to train these models. And I think if you want to create a more neutral counterbalance, I mean, we in Europe are very paranoid about this, right? Because everything is coming from the States yeah, uh, or maybe China. Um, I think that's why here there's a lot of talking about creating a 
European superpower that can kind of combat this. European cloud has been government funded to kind of counterbalance AWS and Azure and so on. So I think there's a role for play. The question is how successful will that be? But I think there's, there's enough evidence that at least you can try and it would make sense. My, but the question mm -hmm. is how well can we distribute government money? I think yeah. there has been some very bad examples in the past. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. What do you think, Martin? No, I, I think the incubation field uh, and uh, that and uh, creating uh, that sort of uh, research area is essential. That people gain experience with what works, what doesn't work, right? That's that's how we will get to better solutions also in the future. Uh, and I think there, the, the funding can play a significant role, right? Because those are those are the kind of projects uh, that, for example, I, well, companies with a big research and development department are willing to go in if it's privatized, right? But uh, normally, most companies try and stay away from, especially if it's something experimental, something that hasn't been proven. People generally in the manufacturing sphere now, again, are looking for results instantly. They don't want to, you know, first have to experiment for 10 years to find out that it doesn't work. Uh, and I think that's where the government can support a lot in terms of these incubation projects uh, and support, uh, you know, smaller companies or medium-sized companies and at actually, you know, developing new ideas and new ways of solving these problems. And that'll, that'll bring with it the growth and the acceleration in these fields that, that one hopes to see. Yeah. One thing I'd like to add there, but I, what I think we have to adjust is this, because I think from just, I know government funds that also we've received in the past, it's very much focused on just, you know, R&D, you have to develop something new completely from scratch. And I don't think that's really the way to go for many of those fields. I think it's really how effectively can you take what's already out there and apply it to your use case and build on top of other things. And I think we definitely have to change this these R&D um, like structures in a way that these kind of advances on top of a base technology are also kind of seen as equally innovative or e equally fundable because mm -hmm. I think some fundamental research might still be needed, but I think on many fields, we are thinking an AI application age uh, where we just have to start to get it out in the field. And yeah, that's just another take I want to add. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I would very much say the, uh, the model that I see or was thinking about is a very like an incubation hub type thing right where we've got new companies working with existing companies working on real data yeah. the, that's 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 the magic formula not Agreed. theoretical yeah. formulas somewhere you know, in the text yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah hey listen just in to to respect your time and stick to our i just want to kind of wrap with with kind of a two-phase question um the first is kind of if we look forward um you know, what new applications, especially within electronics manufacturing, do you think we might see coming out of, out of you would, through AI over the next, I don't know, 12, 20 year or two? And, and right along with that would be, what advice then would you offer to companies in the space, especially like EMS companies who want to leverage uh, AI in their operations to improve efficiencies? If you want, yeah. Martin, I can take the business operations part, and then you can you okay. can take the actual shop floor part. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, for me, if I if you know from if the, in the business operations space, I think there it's um, it's really about how like how much can you like leverage like additional data that you might have that are currently is trapped in your P system, EMS systems, and so on, and can it bring it into the business application space where you can, mm -hmm. like, for example, in the space where we are in, in the quoting space, how can you like leverage data that's like downstream to make even more informed decisions um, or in that space to kind of like foresee kind of issues that might come along downstream or additional risks that are not like, you know, supply risk and so on. That's something we kind of already support, but really from your own manufacturing operation to have even more informed decisions. And I think that's like a space where I feel manufacturing will come into the business processes where we also see like a lot of potential, um, yeah, to just improve decision-making. Yeah. So yeah, the first part of the question, right? So the advice, I think, uh... I, I believe that a good strategy is essential for like a, a digital roadmap in your organization. So you need to, number one, understand. Uh, so I believe very much in actually having a tiered approach to these skills within your environment. You don't want to just introduce AI 
uh, and have one or two people in the whole organization who can run it, right? It's, it's very much about get, become, letting it become organic with how you do your, and, and structure your processes in future. So, uh, you know, have a, have a step to know, and a roadmap about how you're going to start with maybe simple use cases that you can get going. But then what's the next step? How are you going to get the process engineers involved with what you're doing? And then ultimately, how are you going to then get to these, these much larger, much more strategic use cases that you're going to, uh, where, you, where I feel like the objective for manufacturing, especially if you think about uh, manufacturing is basically being your IP as a manufacturer, right? That's what you know. Those are what, that's where your value add is. How are you going to start digitizing those in future for yourself, right? Because you ultimately want to take those with, keep your business going and keep it competitive in the future. So that's the one tier uh, that, that's important. The other one is to, uh, with that in mind, plan also from an architect. Obviously, I come from the infrastructure point of view. Plan how you're going to do your connectivity roadmaps. What is your infrastructure going to look like? What is your digital ecosystem going to look like? Uh, specifically, if we move away, uh, or if we move to the real-time environment normally required in production, where we don't have the luxury of waiting seven seconds for you know a huge model to run in the cloud and then give me an answer. We've got to know it virtually instantaneously. Otherwise, we're losing it, you know, a couple of milliseconds at each uh, cycle. Those are the kind of things that we need to consider. How do I get that back there? How do I get it running uh, with my own requirements? And it's also something that can't just be uh, planned. You know, you have to plan uh, short term and have individual steps about how you're going to get to your long term vision on that. Yeah. yeah, maybe to yeah, answer the second idea. tier, sorry, the yeah. second tier is, as you said, I think the sandbox approach, like rolling it out step by step makes sense. But I think one thing to add is really like, look what's out there, like work, trust the experts, don't reinvent the wheel. Like if you have to reinvent the wheel, there's like lots of open source out there. So I think it's really like, no one should just feel it's like, uh, it's it has to be an art and it, you have to reinvent everything. I think that's my one advice, like, Ever you can take off the shelf, like we do yeah. with components, <laughs> yeah. then just do it. Yeah. There's a yeah. wonderful expression yeah. in German that the, everyone says, everybody cooks with water, right? So everybody in the SMT field or EMS field has the same problem. So yeah. uh, there's, a, there's a good uh, library of use cases already available for people to start off and kick off. And you've got instantaneous return on investment. It's tangible. You can prove it. It's all been proved like five or six times by different people, you know, different companies already. That's that's how you immediately get the buy-in from management too. Then, right? You've got this. You can implement it quickly, and you've you've got immediate tangible results at the end of the day. Yeah. And and then you go into the long-term strategies. Yeah, some quick successes, some quick wins are hugely valuable. And I really like Sebastian's point very early on in the conversation that AI isn't always the answer. Sometimes there, is, there are much simpler answers, so you don't have to go for that. The other thing I would add is I've spoken to numerous startups in this sector that are you know, doing different things in the supply chain space, doing different things in adaptable automation and robotic space where they're using AI that are really, really smart. And I think you know, kind of embracing and listening to those people um, is what I would do if I was a, a, an EMS guy. Just talk to as many people as possible because... Rest assured, there are so many people that know more about AI than most EMS executives and certainly more than Eric and I. So um, yeah. get out and ask people. Yeah, good. Well, gentlemen, um, thank you for your time today. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us. I know I feel a little smarter at the end of this than I was at the beginning of this. So at least from my perspective, mission accomplished. So, um, but continued success to both of you. Hopefully we can uh, pick this up again in the future. Listen, I know we probably could have gone hours on this topic. But I think this gives a very good, good overview of it. And thank you both for, uh, for your contributions. Thank, no, you, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.